present and future. My name is Sue Sampson. I'm the facilitator of this meeting. This looks As an external independent facilitator, my role is to help ensure that the meeting is productive and runs effectively. Oh my God, I'd now like to introduce two of the regional councillors, Mayor Paul Antonio, Councillor Anne Machine, Councillor Bill Kahis, Councillor Jeff McDonald. Councillor Megan O'Hara Sullivan, Councillor Mike Williams, Councillor Nancy Summerfield, and Councillor Carol Taylor. We have apologies from Councillor Tate, and I, I think Councillor Joe Ramio will join us shortly. Um, can I let you know, please, that Mayor Paul Antonio has a long-standing um, commitment partway through this meeting, and he's done everything he can to be here for the part that he can be, but he will have to leave us partway through this session. But he assures me he's very attentive to this process. May I also introduce our nominated community speakers, Janet Mybush, Mark, and Mark Trentel, Barbara Ryan, Shane Egan, Penny Farringhall, and Chris Mybush. The purpose of this meeting today is to allow councillors to listen to the views of the community about the development application. Some 240 submitters have made representations to council in relation to this application, and these will be reviewed and considered carefully as part of the assessment process. The purpose of today's meeting is to enable the community to verbally present key perspe perspectives to councillors via six key speakers and one video presentation. These speakers have been identified by the community to represent key community perspectives. Today's presentations will be used along with the submissions received as part of the development application process to assist the council to fully consider the important issues raised by the community. There are two key points that I need to bear in mind when facilitating today's meeting. First is that we have a clear time limit of one hour with a hard stop at 4pm. Some councillors have other engagements after this meeting and I'm sure many of you do as well. Second, the purpose of this meeting is to enable the councillors present to listen to the identified community speakers. That's it. This is a one-way communication exercise from the community to councillors. The councillors are not at liberty to engage in discussion at this time about the development application because their active involvement in, their active involvement in any capacity may prejudice their vote at the end of the development application exercise. So this is a listening, a listening exercise. So to quickly outline the format of the meeting, firstly we'll hear from the assessment officer, Lachlan O'Sullivan, to outline the development application status. Then we will hear from the six nominated speakers and we'll watch a brief video prepared by the community as well. Each speaker will have seven minutes to present and I'll help manage that if necessary, but I'm sure that won't be needed. Um, and then we'll then hear briefly from Lachlan again. So just to be clear, the meeting format and indeed the wider development application process does not allow the councillors to engage in any discussion. So I'll ask you not to direct questions to councillors or to interrupt the nominated speakers. And we'll close the meeting at 4pm. Thank you. So I'll hand over now to Lachlan O'Sullivan. Thank you, Sue. My name is Lachlan O'Sullivan and I'm a Toowoomba Council uh, Senior Planner. My role is to manage this development application through the process set out in the State Government's Development Assessment Rules. I anticipate most of you will receive correspondence bearing my name and contact details. If you find yourself wanting to ask questions about any of my presentation, given the time constraints today, I ask that you uh, hold your questions. I'm more than happy to discuss with you following the meeting and request that you give me a phone call or, or email. If you don't have my contact details, I provide, will provide them separately at the end of this presentation. I've prepared a number of slides today with the intention of clarifying the specifics of this application, as well as bringing everyone up to speed with the status of this development application. The, de 
development application is for two distinct permits. Firstly, an application for a preliminary approval for a variation request to vary the effect of the planning scheme for a master plan residential community. And secondly, a development permit is sought for reconfiguring a lot being aged into 46 residential lots and as identified as stage one. On the screen is the proposed master plan provided by the applicant in response to council's information request. There are three residential precincts proposed over the site, drainage corridors, parkland, and other site features. This plan is part of the applicant's variation request and the applicant is seeking approval of the conceptual details shown here. This application seeks a development permit for the first stage of the development as highlighted on the screen. The balance of the plan shown on the screen is indicative only and if the application were to be approved would not be included within any development permit for the reconfiguring a lot but rather the layout would be used to inform any subsequent development applications for the following stages which would be assessed in accordance with the variation document. The development application was lodged under the Planning Act 2016. The development application is therefore assessed in accordance with the process adopted under the State Government's DA rules. I have provided a diagrammatic representation of that process on the screen and as you can see the application has substantially progressed and is currently in the decision part. This application enters the decision part on the 11th of January 2019. The statutory time period for the decision part will end on the 18th of February, which is a total of 25 business days. I note that this period is, un is likely to be extended by agreement between the applicant and council as permitted under the DA rules, which is to allow for a comprehensive assessment of the applicant's response. Uh, for that to be completed and for us to be able to review all of the submissions that we've received. The practice of extending a decision part the decision part to allow for further assessment is not specific to this DHA project and is standard where dealing with major projects involving multiple complex technical considerations. Regarding the appeal step shown on the screen, I will provide more detail about this at the end of today's presentation. Council is currently assessing the applicant's information response to determine if the proposal meets the requirements of the Toowoomba Regional Council Planning Scheme 2012. A number of significant issues are currently being reviewed by Council and external peer reviewing is underway. In relation to the submissions made by the community, Council has received submissions objecting to and also supporting the proposed development. The planning based matters raised in every submission will be given due consideration as part of the decision making process. At this time in the decision making process, officers are yet to form a final opinion final view in relation to the application for recommendation to the council. The full range of options are to refuse, to approve in part, or to approve in full. I thank you for listening and I now hand it over to Janet Bundle um, to start the presentations. Deputy Mayor Taylor, Councillors, Facilitator Sue, and staff. 
thousands of words have been written about the DHA Mount Lofty residential development application. Today, five main speakers will represent the concerns of the community, the community of Toowoomba and Mount Lofty, who are the people who are in fact opposed to these, this development. Community concerns arise out of a mutual responsibility. A mutual responsibility to promote physical and mental health and the safety of all citizens. A mutual responsibility to maintain the garden city image. A mutual responsibility to promote and preserve military and sporting club history, to protect irreplaceable indigenous and native bushland heritage. Toowoomba Mount Lofty residents are anxious. Some are angry. They're angry that an area of biological, uh, environmental, ecologically significant legacy may soon be lost. Lost under the roar of the bulldozers and the chainsaws. Once lost, the area, the natural bushland is lost forever. It's gone. Toowoomba residents are also very angry that a federal government consortium is going to profit from our pain. So we entreat you councillors, please hear what your constituents' concerns are about this development. Thank you. So I've come out of retirement today, and the reason I've come out of retirement to talk to you today is because for about a few decades of my working career, I was interested in the way the planning laws protected the environment. And uh, one of the aspects of the environment was, in fact, koalas. They had a pretty, they've had a pretty rough treatment over the last 20 years. We've had uh, local planning schemes, such as the Toowoomba Regional Planning Scheme. We've had state planning policies. We've had decisions of the Planning Environment Court, yet the latest study by the University of Queensland, which was uh, commissioned by the Department of Envir Environment and Heritage Protection, as it was then, in 2015, said on the Koala Coast area and the Pine Rivers Koala areas, the numbers of koalas have reduced by 80% and 50%. That's a staggering number, and I was just fascinated when this development application came up and um, there are koalas here in Toowoomba that we might be able to protect and I think we should. However, you've heard from Lachlan about the details of this application. Um, what council's got to consider are the planning grounds on which you can refuse this application and I think there are a few and the other speakers will mention a few as well. Just looking at your uh, planning scheme, this particular area has no relevant zone, it's zone government facilities, uh, government precinct, and everybody acknowledges that that's a bit out of date now. So the zoning itself is not significant. So there's no zoning obligation on council. Bits of the planning scheme, such as the strategic framework, high level stuff, tell you councillors, 
that existing areas of ecological significance, including vulnerable species, koalas, are retained and, where possible, enhanced and connected by environmental corridors. Digging down further into the planning scheme, you will know that there are overlays. One of the overlays on this particular block of land that Council in its consideration, regardless of the fact of its previous history, put over this area is an environmental significance overlay. It says, avoid or minimise impacts of development on biodiversity values of ecosystems, such as the one up at the end of the rifle range, ecological processes, areas of ecological significance. Its desired outcomes, they ain't speak for what you want at the end of the day, impacts on biodiversity values of ecosystem, areas of ecological significance and biodiversity cor corridors are avoided. So there's, what I'm saying is, council's hands are not tied. You don't go to a planning meeting, shake your head, and be advised by planners such as Lockham to say, well, that's what the poor others, but that's what the planning scheme uh, basically says, and you say, oh, we don't want to do it. Well, this is not one of those examples. What the applicant says in this application is, well, throw out the provision suit planning theme and let's put in what, we, what suits us, a master plan estate. This estate, or this suggestion, this piece of land, a huge piece of land, 379 hectares, is not in council's planning, not in its priority infrastructure area, it's not in its local government infrastructure plan. Council does planning about the number of people that are coming into Toowoomba, and a, an example of the current planning that's going on is the Drayton Land Use Study. Now, it's to come to fruition this year. This developer has not made decisions in relation to council's planning. Other developers, private developers, have looked at what council is thinking about, made their decisions about their land stock in relation to what they might be able to do in the future. This particular site is not part of council's planning. Can I just go down even further into the application itself? Lot sizes, that's been a particular point of interest for council over the last few years since its planning scheme of uh, 2012. Um, there's been a bit of flack coming your way in relation to small lot development below 450 square metres and um, duplexes in inappropriate sidings. You've gone through a process of changing the planning scheme. Amendment 16 to the planning scheme, which I think is shortly to come to fruition. Now, this development in its master planning says we're going to have development as low as 300 square metres. We can have development as low as 300 square metres. And it says in a response to Council's information request, our dual occupancy is not anticipated. If the master plan uh, is agreed to by Council, and applications done for dual occupancy on small lots, Council will sit around a room and say, well, the planning scheme, such as it's been varied by this development application, says we can do these things. And what are we going to do? Get our heads beat in the planning environment court again. Just can I mention the present application, the 46 lots that are to be developed at the moment. 12 of those are left less than 450 square metres already. That's what they're proposing on the one that it goes ahead now within the next 12 months. Just can I come back to the koalas again? According to the applicant's own report, 44 of the 53 hectares to be developed are regarded by the applicant as critical koala habitat. 38 hectares, as Janet was saying, are to be bulldozed and chainsawed. 40, 38 to 44 hectares. Now, there's another strand I wanted to follow. There's a thing called, complicated name, as federal legislation. There's something called the Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. This application, because it affects area in which there's a koala population, koalas are vulnerable um, as far as the federal classification is concerned, so that the applicant has done what they should do and has referred it all to the Federal Department of Environment. The Federal Department of Environment has said yes, it needs a referral. However, we will make our decision based upon the documentation that the applicant has provided. Some of that documentation says this isn't an important koala habitat. So it's not important. Besides that, we're here in Canberra making these decisions, not a council sitting here in Toowoomba.
about something that might be a one-off thing for generations. Can I just say, despite um, that assessment by the Federal uh, Department of Environment, there's uh, recent authority in the Court of Appeal in Queensland affirming a decision of the Planning and Environment Court that says just because the Federal Department makes a decision that says it's in favour of the development, that doesn't determine it as far as the local council is concerned. That decision's Boral and Gold Coast City Council of the Court of Appeal in Queensland. So just because the Federal Government says something doesn't mean that you say, oh, the Federal Government said it's okay, we'll forget it. You've got to do an independent assessment. An independent assessment that your own advice is saying you should do. Finally, looking at, looking at provisions of the Planning Act. There's two things. Precautionary principle, you might have heard of it before. Basically, it says when um, there's danger of the loss of irreversible harm or serious environmental harm to a species, then you should be very cautious and not make that decision. I'd submit that the habitat on this site is likely to be subject to irreversible harm. And therefore, the Planning Act says that you should be very cautious and not make that decision to eliminate that habitat. And lastly, there's a principle also in the Planning Act which binds you as the planning authority in Toowoomba region that says that um, you should make decisions considering present and future generations. I'd submit to you that the decision you're going to make on this development site should be one for future generations. Yeah. And it should be maintained. <laughs> Today I'm talking about my specialty, which is disaster behaviour, um, and this is an interest that had roots in the 2002 bushfires. At the time I was the Corporate Communication Manager at Toowoomba Regional Council, Toowoomba City Council as it was known, and my team handled the communications for the local disaster management group during that fire. So I remember that on the last day of, of the fires, after we'd already lost um, buildings on this site, um, the LPMG met at 6am and we were told that we were going to lose houses that day at Prince Henry Heights. Luckily it rained. Um, but since then I've learned a lot about how people react in a bushfire and I'm going to share this with you today. So there are three reasons for my concern about this wildland urban development and they all relate to aspects of human behaviour in a disaster and, and all of this um, has been completely overlooked um, in terms of the planning and the um, rules that govern the planning process. A bushfire doesn't become a disaster until people and assets are involved. So number one, people don't prepare for bushfire even if they have experience. More than 70% of wildland urban interface residents had no awareness of the threat on the days that the Premier of um, Victoria and the CFA chiefs were giving warnings um, and they did nothing to prepare. People overestimate their ability to defend their homes. And they also say they will evacuate, but only have vague, vague plans on the routes, where they're going, um, and no understanding of the time it would take them to leave, to collect their precious items, um, their pets and their children before they leave. Studies consistently show that 85 to 90% of people who live in the bushfire area plan to leave, um, but they won't do so until they see the planes coming and um, 24 people died in the Black Saturday bushfires as a result of that level of um, planning. The key reason for not preparing is the time pressure of day-to-day -day routines, especially with um, families with children. I've done research for Queensland Fire and Emergency Services along the escarpment, interviewing residents in um, bushfire um, vulnerable areas like this development. Um, and this lack of preparation is um, really key, as well as the belief that it's never going to be that bad here. People tend to be overconfident in their abilities to deal with a bushfire. 
um, they misunderstand fire behaviour and the impact of ember attack. On Black Saturday, um, embers were recorded to have landed up to 30 kilometres from the fire front. And they also don't realise that fire travels four times faster up a 20 degree slope. So that's four times for every 20 degrees that the um, slope adds. The number two reason I was concerned about this was that response behaviour never goes to agency's plan or expectations, and that includes um, council, which is heavily involved in the LDNG. Most people are not plugged into warning channels such as ABC radio and emergency agency social media sites. Mobile phone warning messages are notoriously unreliable, especially under the load of phone traffic if there's um, a major incident. In Paradise, California, which was only a couple of months ago, um, people were receiving the text message to evacuate six hours after the fire burned the, the town. When a warning is finally received, for most people it will be late in the warning cycle and it's really hard to act rationally and make decisions in a really considered way. And, um, and it also prevents them from taking the time to enact their plan because suddenly they're under time pressure that they didn't expect. So the third reason was that people don't evacuate quickly and small obstacles help them decide not to do it. Um, they underestimate the level of stress they will experience. The stress causes them to think, to not to think clearly and it increases their response times. So if people haven't practiced their plan, um, and we know that most people will plan to leave, they will undertake what we call milling. So they'll check for more information, ring family and friends for advice, and generally fluff around while they make a decision. And this was really evident in the Twin Tower attacks in um, 2001. People won't contemplate evacuation until their family and pets are reunited and they can evacuate together. So this means that people will drive home when they find out about a fire. They won't just evacuate. Um, schools are also at our site of convergence. So if it's a school day, um, parents will go to the schools to get their kids first. And they won't leave in one car. Each car in that family is going to be packed up to the gunnels with possessions before they leave. So every family is going to have um, as many cars as they own on the road. And while this is happening, agencies are trying to get in with large vehicles. So at a recent fire in Mount Luke in December, Mount Luke is just north of Toowoomba, about 30 k's, um, in the middle of the state forest, so no houses, no buildings threatened, um, 22 fire appliances arrived at that fire. So, and that wasn't including um, water resupply vehicles. So you can just imagine the scenario, if buildings are threatened, Queensland Fire and Emergency Services responds with many more vehicles than that, um, and at the same time, at least 600 cars are trying to leave, which is a realistic scenario on a weekend. So Black Saturday um, happened on a weekend. So my submission referred to recommendations by the um, Black Saturday Bushfires um, Royal Commission, sorry, um, which came up with 19 recommendations on planning and building in bushfire areas. Um, including this one. It would be tempting to dismiss um, these in our context, that is in the Toowoomba, Queensland context, because we don't get Victorian style bushfires in Queensland. Well, as of November, we do. We had a catastrophic fire danger rating over a number of days in central Queensland um, for the first time since the category was invented, and the category was invented as a response to the Black Saturday bushfires. Key sections of the Yungala National Park near Mackay, which is a rainforest national park, were burnt. About 8,000 people in the Rockhampton suburb of Gracemere were evacuated, and 15 houses and sheds were burned. Toowoomba had good rain in October, and that's the only reason it didn't happen here. So we're in danger of not learning the lessons that the southern states have, um, have learned already. So we, also, we have the opportunity here to circumvent this really steep learning curve. Um, that they have already experienced and which unfortunately have been driven by loss of life. Recommendation 46 came about because 173 people died. We really don't want that to be happening here.
Masters, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. Microphone. Sorry, I'm start it again. I'm up there. Uh, Councillors, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. The great artist Thomas Cole said, if we lose touch with nature, we shall lose touch with ourselves. A quote of Noel Fitzpatrick, animals on earth are not disposable waste. This proposed federal government sponsored DHA housing scheme will have a major environmental impact on Mount Lofty and the surrounding ecologies. The clear fell removal of all large host trees, the natural forest and grassland will destroy all fauna, flora and biota that live in its embrace. It can never be replaced. January 2011 showed us what a major rain event can do. To this city, to the lower reaches of the Lockyer Valley, and to the people who lived through it or died because of it. A major factor to the cause of that catastrophe was increased urban development within the Toowoomba catchment basin, and there was a serious lack of flood mitigation planning for natural flow runoff retention. The developer states that its subject site is not will not present a flood danger. With proposed perpendicular roads running down slopes as steep as 12%, houses wall to wall, with no natural retention or proper contouring, it is naive to believe that there will be no danger. One of DHA, at one of DHA's open days, their engineer informed me that every house will have a water tank. <laughs> and that there'll be a retention basin at the bottom of Enfield Court. I commented, commented that flood runoff to this proposed basin actually comes from above the subject site. I suggested that the 270 millimetres of rain in 24 hours might overflow the water tanks. <laughs> There's been no serious flood control planning of the subject site. Heavy rain in the vicinity of this 342 lot housing project will generate extreme fast flow flooding over the development's hard surfaces to fall directly into Lockyer Creek. There will be nothing to stop it. The proposed development presents a very real danger to Toowoomba's eastern range and a grave threat to Lockyer Valley residents. 2011 floods did happen. 23 people died. One only needs to look at the recent effects of climate change around the world to know that it will happen again. The cost of ensuring 100% protection from landslide hazard, the damage to visual, amen visual amenity by meter, meters high retaining walls, the deep excavations and foundation footings required on the steep slopes of this subject site should in itself and now the development. The experts that researched the subject site were obviously not present in January 2011. They didn't witness the myriad of springs that popped up all around Mount Lofty and the subject site and stayed for months. They didn't see the metre wall of water pouring down the Toowoomba Range Road or watch Martini's or watch or watch Martini Street and Rifle Range Road cascading. They didn't see the many houses in the streets of this suburb that were inundated with flood water, nor witness the inches of water running through my garage at 37 Martini Street for weeks after the event. A major rain event will be exacerbated by this massive development. People's properties and lives will be at great risk. The developer has generously offered to gift our council 320 hectares of their lowland in Escarpment as an extension to Jubilee Park. 
They don't want this land. They claim it's too rugged and densely overgrown to develop. It's also contaminated with heavy metals and who knows what organisms. Law states that landowners have responsibility to maintain their properties to protect against bushfires, soil erosion, contamination and noxious weeds. I don't believe DHA is exempt from this law. Should our councillors accept this developer's gift? I believe they'll be accepting a poison chalice. By gifting the land to our council, who will be responsible for the long-term maintenance? Why? The ratepayers of Toowoomba Regional Council? I note that the pristine forest of both Redwood and Jubilee Parks has already been compromised by clearing for bushfire maintenance. Let the developer keep his gift and maintain it as the law demands. Perhaps he can look again at how it might be better used. Loss of amenity. Residents who live in the Mount Lofty suburb do so for a number of reasons. The quality of life, the views and the proximity to the city. This development will just destroy this amenity. The stress of watching bulldozers decimate beautiful bushland. The beepers and the squawkers of heavy equipment the contaminated dust, the noise of construction and wildlife destruction of the proposed 10 year life of this project will be devastating. The estimated loss of existing properties during construction is estimated by agents to range from 10 to 30%. Mount Lofty residents include all spectrums. Older folk need the value of their properties to perhaps move to aged care or retirement accommodation. These are huge costs. For some, their property may be their only tangible asset. Younger residents may want to sell and move away for all the, all the reasons that the people do. They will lose much of their equity. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, the DHA, the subject site, is just another paddock of public owned bushland. They can turn into mega dollars to the Commonwealth Masters. But this land is part of what Toowoomba represents, part of what makes this top of the range garden city unique. Does it have to be destroyed in the name of progress? So, councillors, please stop. Take a deep breath. And decide what you honestly believe is best for Toowoomba, not the developer. Give this beautiful city the legacy of your foresight and wisdom. Thank you. Microclimate. This area is subject to orographic fog, 
That is not the same as the rest of Toowoomba. It's a local phenomenon caused by moist air going up the side of the escarpment. I took these two photos five minutes apart. You should clearly be able to see the difference in visibility. This is an, uh, an aberration. This happens all the time. For example, seven of the last 10 days have just been like this. Toowoomba can be in blazing sunshine. Mount Lofty is looking like that. Oh, by the way, that is not in the traffic report. So let's have a quick look at the development footprint. This is, as has been mentioned, a massive development. The lot sizes are tiny, crammed in, and that means more cars, obviously. The red dots represent the two exits that everyone has to funnel through, and remember that bushfire scenario. And everyone from there goes down to one choke point, the rifle range road intersection. In addition, uh, seven, or eight, seven or eight of the surrounding intersections have been identified as already, right now, today, exceeding operational thresholds. Several times it's been mentioned in the developer's traffic report that because these already exist, these problems, it is not their problem if they make it worse. <laughs> <laughs> Kate Street, I'm going to call that one out. It's important because Kate Street channels the through traffic from Highfields. The intersection with Ruffin Street there has been identified as extremely dangerous. The street itself is narrow and cars have to go into oncoming traffic if they want to get around the park school buses from downlands and park vehicles. People still use it though. Why? Well, for a start, they're dropping hundreds of down, downland students off. And secondly, the intersection just below that, North Street in Ruffin, is so congested and tangled up that people want to avoid it at all costs. And the remaining five sets of traffic light between them and the CBD. So they go up Cade Street anyway. Now we'll get to another danger spot. This is the North Street, Stewart Street, Rifle Range Road intersection inside that yellow circle. You should be able to note from there that Stewart Street dog legs across North Street. Rifle Range Road enters it a few car lengths up. Up there on the left, you can see the Infinite Care Nursing Home. That actually hasn't opened yet, but it has 132 beds, 80 staff, not including visitors, allied health professionals, and service trucks. There are just recently constructed three new entries and exits on the crest of a hill. None of this is actually existing yet, it's imminent. We are all praying that we don't get on the street car parking opposite this development for a very simple reason. All during the construction period, there was hundreds over time of youths and trucks and tradies parked there. And guess what? You actually have to go over double white lines or on them to get past. So we are hoping that that's not going to continue with an ongoing parking situation. And we haven't finished yet, because on the other side of the road, we have the Mount Lofty Nursing Home, 40 units, by the way, not 132. Most of the time, that is 1.5 lanes wide because of the on-street parking. So just imagine those extra 3,400 daily car trips. And we haven't finished yet, because in the other side of the intersection is the Toowoomba State High School, which is also a bus interchange. So let's take a little bit of a look at Rifle Range Road. This is what the on-street parking looks like, that's two directions, same day, from 40 bed nursing home. Now I just want you to imagine for a minute 132 beds on the other side of the intersection on a crest. The developer has proposed traffic lights. These traffic lights at that intersection will be triggered after stage three has been completed. In other words, after approximately 1,700 extra daily car trips, plus the construction traffic has been generated. So that means all the road users here will have who knows how many years of increased risk. I would also like to add, we all agree that traffic lights are vital, but they will create an extra problem that once again has not been addressed anywhere in the traffic report. That is Benjamin Street, that longer horizontal photo there. Benjamin Street is the local overflow street. 
everyone who lives in Mount Lofty knows that you use Benjamin Street to avoid that Rifle Range Road Stewart intersection. <laughs> so when you get traffic lights at Rifle Range Road, there will be delays. And that's actually backed up in the developer's report, but it's quite clearly stated, there will be delays. It'll be safer, but it'll be slower. A traffic engineer worth their salt can tell you that traffic acts like water. Delays cause it to overflow to the point of lowest resistance, which is Benjamin Street. <laughs> Benjamin Street has dangerous design flaws. This photo doesn't show it clearly enough, but it is single lanes with a three metre drop, a reverse camera corner, where you tired if you speed because you can end up in that house's front yard and that has happened. There are blind spots in both directions and crests. All of this has strangely been left out of the traffic report. So I would like to, you to imagine these streets down the track. The new nursing home has opened, earth moving equipment is trundling around, there's trailers, there's trucks, there's new residents moving in. But those narrow streets are still narrow. You can't change that and you can't change the fog. It's a horrendous danger to everyone using the roads, especially all the children around there with the schools. And also, I invite you to imagine a bushfire with the emergency vehicles panicking households and thick smoke over everything. Increased accidents are inevitable. I have a folder full of emails from locals to prove that. I would also point you to the fact that there is a debate around the use of the word accident because it implies that no one is responsible. I submit to you that drivers and pedestrians are not the only ones responsible. That lies with traffic engineers, planning staff, and our elected leaders. And that means that you all have a crucial part to play. On behalf of everyone using the roads around Mount Lofty, we ask you to take your responsibility seriously. We ask you to reject this development application, and we also ask you to remember that we are talking about public land here. So don't let a federal government corporation put their profits over our community's safety. Thank you. This proposed development is massive. 342 lots of medium density housing, bulldozing 38 hectares of critical koala habitat, that is 76 football fields. A hectare is 100 by 100, a football field is 100 by 50, we've got 76 football fields of beautiful eucalypts that are going to be bulldozed on Toowoomba's greenfield escarpment land. This development will also rip $100 million gross land sales out of our community, going straight to the federal government developer in Canberra. <laughs> What's worse, this developer is asking council to ignore your planning scheme and accept their massive master plan, based on the developer's inadequate reports. Here are just two examples of the inadequacy of the reports. Council's only expert to date has raised significant ecological concerns with the development across the whole of the east of the site. Basically that ecologist is saying that east of the site, that, that land is so ecologically significant that you shouldn't build on it. Then, the planning department went to the developer and said, can you answer this? Not answered at all. I, I read about 40 or 50 pages of waffle and they did not answer this, this issue. The second inadequacy with their reports. <laughs> oh, I just, just showed you something there, haven't I? <laughs> the, the second issue with the reports is the the developer's bushfire expert doesn't even reference the bushfire that burnt out this site on the 26th of October 2002. I'll say that again. We have a bushfire expert coming to advise on this site and they haven't even talked to the residents or the landholder that had control of this, the lease of this land for 30 years and they didn't come and talk to them. 
Clearly for such a massive proposal, Council needs to get peer assessed with us. Pleased to hear, Lachlan, that you're in that process now of getting a lot more uh, peer assessment reviews of the developer's reports, not just undertake a desktop assessment of this development application. Your planning department's major concern was that the proposed development is outside the council's priority infrastructure area. So the developer was asked by your planning department to show that there's an overriding need for additional residential land outside of this area. Reasonable request. Now, I've read the response from the, from the developer. They went on and on. They identified for us that there are existing 4,583 lots being developed currently within the, the PIA in Toowoomba. And there's a further 5,726 lots on the drawing boards, all inside the PIA. The issue is that there's no evidence there that an additional 340 lots outside the PIA is needed at this stage. So what do these Toowoomba residents, Mount Lofty residents, want from you as their elected representatives? Residents want councillors to reject this DA in its present form. You've heard the reasons why today, the legal planning and environmental obligations covered by Mark Tranter, the catastrophic bushfire risk, sobering stuff from, from Barbara Ryan, the stormwater runoff issues covered by Shane Egan, and the major traffic problems so graphically shown by Perry Cl uh, Penny Claringmore. We want council, we want you to get your own reports to determine for yourself what is the best use of this site for future residents of Toowoomba. We then want you to go away and negotiate with this developer for a better outcome for all Toowoomba residents, not just the DA focused on big cash for this Canberra-based developer. You can go and look at your recent uh, case, recent important precedent of the Shangri-La development of escarpment land at Prince Henry Heights. Without any of your own expert reports, your council rejected that development application and look where you are now in the Planning Environment Court. But look what Judge Rackerman in the Planning Environment Court just did the other day. He did exactly what we're asking for you to do here. He asked the parties to go away and negotiate out a better reduced development proposal. And that's what we're asking for you here today. But what we want as residents what we really want is for this top of escarpment site, this precious site, to be developed as a community park and added to Council's green infrastructure strategy. Yeah. 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 And that's, that's not a novel concept, as, as you have seen. We've got a quote here from the Mayor uh, two weeks ago, I think it was three weeks ago now. We've all heard his call on Channel 7 News exclusive. The Mayor's call for a new Queen's Park in Toowoomba. We couldn't agree more. Yeah. Well, councillors, look what we've got for you. This is a once only opportunity for the council to create a top of escarpment community park. The next Queen's Park and reinforce Toowoomba's credentials is truly a garden city. Yeah. Now, I can hear you asking, can we work with this government developer to create such a top of escarpment park for Toowoomba? Well, absolutely you can. Here is the Jazine Foreshore in Townsville, a clear precedent. It's a wonderful community park developed from the former Defence Department land. It's precisely what the Townsville Council achieved from the former Jazine Barracks on, on Townsville's foreshore. Has anyone spoken to the, the Townsville City Council?
In summary, to approve a massive medium density residential development on extreme bushfire risk escarpment land based only on the developer's own reports is quite frankly a recipe for disaster. We've all read Council's positive motto, rich traditions, bold ambitions. Past Toowoomba Councils have provided us with many rich traditions. Queen's Park, tree-lined streets, Toowoomba's Carnival of Flowers. As our current Council, I ask you, what are your bold ambitions? want to be remembered for in 50 or 100 years time. <laughs> Atop of Escarpment Park in Mount Lofty is one bold ambition Council can deliver on for our community and for our future generations. <laughs> our presentation concludes now with some words from a Mount Lofty esteemed <laughs> elder. Uh, I'm Janet Anderson, my husband and I leased the rifle range from 1980 until, 19, until 2013, where we ran about 40 horses and operated riding school off the rifle range. I knew that land really well and loved it dearly. There were magnificent wildlife there, undamaged by human people, bears and birds, echidnas. Wallaby, dingoes, you name it, was there. There were snakes, I had pet snakes in my saddle shed there. It was the most beautiful piece of country right in the middle of Toowoomba. And I can't think of anything worse than building on it. It would make a wonderful and a very good park in future years. And we have had people from all over the world coming to visit it. The koala bears and things, there have been lots of those coming and going. Um, there are a lot of beautiful trees there. And it's just really a wild bush place and very, very peaceful. When, the, when it rains, the wonderful river that's right through the range going down the, down the gorge. And great fogs come up too. And you can get out there and hardly know where you are because of the fog. Um, I'm just very sorry that life to be built away with hope to goodness that the council will see see light and turn it into a park so that in 50 years or 100 years people will say how wise they were but people won't be much of that sort of land about assessing all application material to determine whether the proposal meets the requirements of the Toowoomba Regional Planning Scheme 2012. The Planning Act 2016 provides that an application should only be approved where it meets the requirements of the Toowoomba Regional Council Planning Scheme. As mentioned previously, at this time officers are yet to form a final view in relation to the application for recommendation to Council. The full range of options are refusal, approval in part, or approval in full. There are a number of possibilities moving forward depending on the outcome of the application. Should the application be approved in part or full by council, the applicant may make representations to the assessment manager about changing the development approval. These representations are called change representations. Uh, you may know those as a negotiated decision request. Should the application be refused by council, then the applicant may appeal this decision 
to the planning of the primary courts. Should the application be approved in part or full, then the applicant or a submitter may appeal council decision. It should be noted that anyone who has made a properly made submission has the right to appeal council decision should the application be approved in full or in part. Should the application be refused by council and in the event that the applicant appeals council's decision, then anyone who has made a properly made submission also has the right to join the appeal as a correspondent. I know that there are statutory timeframes for commencing such actions and I would suggest that you first seek your own independent legal advice in relation to these matters. It is important to note that in the event of an appeal, council will no longer be the deciding authority but will be a respondent in the appeals proceedings with the role of representing our decision. Lastly, I would like to note <coughs> In the event that the application is approved by Council and the applicant does not appeal the decision, Council will send a copy of the decision notice and the appeal provisions to anyone who has made a properly made submission. Anyone who has made a submission that was not properly made will not receive a copy of the decision notice from Council. However, you can access this information on Council's PD online. Should the applicant appeal council's decision, they are required to serve all properly made submitters with a notice of appeal. I've listed my details on the screen should anyone have any questions about this development application. I've also included the address of the Planning and Environment Court website should you want further information about the appeals process. Thank you and I hand it back to Sue to conclude today's session. And I'd like to conclude the meeting by saying thank you very much to the speakers for your excellent and interesting presentations and, your, and thank you very much to the councillors and thank you very much to everybody who's attended. Thank you. And Janet would like to, to present the councillors with some information from the presentation.